Thank you for joining us today for our webinar. We're excited to have you with us. My name is Amy Perkins, and I'm the Marketing Manager for our Early Childhood Assessment Tools here at Brooks Publishing. This webinar is on using the Preschool Wide Evaluation Tool, or the Preset, to measure, monitor, and achieve positive behavioral interventions and supports in early childhood settings. Preset developers Elizabeth Steed and Tina Pomerlo are going to share a presentation about the tool. But first, I'd like to go over some housekeeping tasks. You'll be muted for the webinar, but if you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box in your GoToWebinar panel, or you can tweet them using hashtag TalkAboutTools. We'll take these questions after the presentation during the Q&A portion. For best audio and screen quality, you may want to exit any unneeded programs. For the presentation, you also might want to minimize the GoToWebinar bar on your monitor so you can see more of your screen. You can do that by clicking the orange button with the arrow in the top corner of the control bar. If you need to enlarge the bar again to ask a question, you can just click the orange button again and the panel will pop back out. Also, we're recording this webinar and you'll receive a link to the recording in a follow-up email tomorrow. We'll also be posting a link to the recording on the Brooks Publishing website. Now I'd like to take the chance to introduce our two speakers. Elizabeth Steed has more than 15 years of experience working with young children with disabilities and their families in preschool, kindergarten, and home settings. She is currently Assistant Professor and Program Coordinator of the Early Childhood Special Education Program in the Department of Educational Psychology and Special Education at Georgia State University. Dr. Seed is Affiliated Faculty in the Center for Leadership and Disability at the University Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities at Georgia State University and a faculty partner for their Leadership Education and Neurodevelopmental and Related Disabilities Program. She is also a member of Georgia's Early Childhood Comprehensive System, Georgia Quest for Quality Inclusion, and the Metro Atlanta Preschool Consortium, where she works in collaboration with Georgia's Early Childhood Special Educators, Administrators, and Policymakers. Dr. Seed has been the Principal Investigator on several research projects focused on building partnerships with preschool teachers to prevent young children's development of challenging behaviors. Tina Pomerlo has more than 10 years of experience working in partnership with early childhood professionals, children, and families in order to effectively address the social and emotional needs of young children with challenging behaviors. Ms. Pomerlo has provided team-based facilitation, individualized consultation, and professional development for the implementation and sustainability of program-wide positive behavior intervention and support within district special education preschool programs, private early childhood programs, and Head Start agencies focusing on the provision of a three-tiered system of behavioral supports for preschool and kindergarten age children. In addition, Ms. Ms. Pomelo also participates in grant writing, research opportunities, and current state and national initiatives, including response to intervention for the advancement of program-wide positive behavior intervention and support in early childhood settings. So we're happy to have both of you here with us today. So I think I can, I'll turn it over to you to start our presentation. Okay, wonderful. Hi, this is Elizabeth Steed at Georgia State University. Tina, you want to say hi? I absolutely will. Hi, I'm Tina Pomerlo from the Southeastern Regional Education Service Center, otherwise known as CERESC. So hello everyone. I hope you're having a wonderful day. This is Elizabeth again. I will start and give you an overview of what we plan to do today during the webinar. First, We'll go over the purpose of the preset and discuss the features of the preset. We'll go over administration and scoring and then look at preset data and how to use those data in real life. And then we'll have a question and answer section portion. We do encourage you to please ask questions throughout using the discussion box on the control panel. That will be really nice to have that Q&A session at the end. The preset is an adaptation of another tool called the school-wide evaluation tool or the set that has been in use for quite some time around school-wide positive behavioral interventions and support or, or school-wide PBIS in K through 12 settings. It's usually the measure that is used as an independent measure of how a school is doing in their implementation of school-wide PBIS. So the preset was developed to have an appropriate alternative measure to 
look at fidelity of implementation of program-wide PBIS in early childhood settings with the understanding that early childhood settings are really different than K-12 settings. There are some similarities between the preset and the set. Um, the preset utilizes many of the same categories of the set, such as having behavioral expectations taught within the classrooms, and there's a monitoring and decision-making such as an organized and predictable environment, which is crucially important, as well as a family involvement or engagement section as well. These items were either revised or added in order to make them applicable to early childhood settings and to be, make sure that um, what we were really measuring was developmentally appropriate for young children. Okay, so the various purposes of the preset are to assess universal features of program-wide PBIS in early childhood settings. It can be done as a pre-assessment and or a post-assessment or an ongoing as a center is implementing PBIS. It helps a program establish, prioritize, and individualize goals around PBIS and create an action plan. It helps the center to measure progress toward achieving program goals. It can help determine professional development needs. Some of the items will identify specific classrooms that may have certain issues um, that appear on the preset that administrators may want to follow up on. And it can also be used for research purposes. I myself use it in my research. As do I in New Hampshire. Yes. So there are eight subscales of the preset. The first is having expectations that are defined, and that subscale has to do with whether or not the center has developed program-wide expectations. And then the second is whether or not they are teaching those expectations in a systematic and intentional way. The third subscale is how the center has planned to respond to children exhibiting those behavioral expectations and other appropriate pro-social behavior, and then how they're consistently responding to children's challenging behavior. And the fourth is having an organized and predictable environment. Some of the items in that scale concern having a visual schedule and having planned transitions. And then monitoring and decision making has to do with having a data management system to monitor children's challenging behavior. And then family involvement is how the program and the teachers, the administrators, how everyone in the program is interacting with families through communications and, and other um, through verbal and paper and in-person communication around social emotional issues. The management is how the center has developed a leadership team to take over this initiative and monitor it on, in an ongoing way. And program support has items that have to do with administrators support, resources that are provided to teachers so they have the time and the materials that they need and the professional development that they need to implement PBIS. The first subscale is how expectations are defined for the center, if they have them or not. And what we're looking for is whether or not they have agreed to five or fewer, it's generally three or four program expectations that apply across routines and classrooms. These expectations should be really broad and they should be stated in positive, simple, and developmentally appropriate language. Like, be kind, be a hard worker, be safe is one example of what a center might come up with. 
The expectations should be posted at children's eye level with words and visuals. Sometimes we will go in and they might have some expectations, but they might be just words. And while that's helpful for the adults in the center, it's not very helpful for the kids who are pre-readers at that point. So the visuals are really helpful. And if those visuals can be pictures of the children themselves engaging in the actions that go along with whatever the expectation is, that's the most helpful. And then we're also looking for whether or not the expectations are incorporated into a behavior matrix. And we'll show you some examples from one center who did develop a behavior matrix and expectations. So the first example that involves feature A expectations defines comes from a program in New Hampshire known as Children Unlimited Incorporated. And uh, in their in the process that they went through in developing their program-wide PBIS system, the team determined that their expectations would be be kind to your friends, be safe with hands and feet, take care of books and toys, and fix it to make it better. And they selected the um, accompanying visuals for the posters in the classrooms that you see here. For the behavior matrix, we're looking for a translation of the very broad expectations into this matrix that has really specific observable behaviors for each of the classroom routines. And this matrix helps provide a common language for teachers to use across those different routines to encourage children's appropriate behavior. To provide you with an example, I am also going to share with you Children Unlimited's Behavior Matrix. This is a um, one page of a five page document in which they really looked at and analyzed each of their expectations and tried to positively express what those expectations mean within the different routines of the day. So here you can see where uh, arrival and morning meeting expectations are outlined for the four broad expectations. So be safe with hands and feet at arrival means take off your outdoor shoes and put on your indoor shoes. That is one of the routines that they have in place and in their program. Another example would be take care of books and toys during morning meeting means use gentle hands when taking a turn to look at and hold another child's toy. For feature B, behavioral expectations taught, we're looking for a few things. Um, one is that when asked, teachers and children can state the ex expectations. So the person who's conducting the preset actually asks the teachers in the classroom, and the teacher asks at least three of the children in the classroom what their program's expectations are. And they ask that in a way that makes sense for that program. Um, and we also want to see some evidence like a lesson plan or a weekly lesson plan where we can see that these behavioral expectations are being taught in some way. So, and those lessons plans should have things like, that are developmentally appropriate, like describing and demonstrating the expectations so that the kids have some discussion around them and are, are given a chance to practice them. Um, some opportunities for children to identify the difference between the two, whether those are in pictures or the teachers acting them out, and opportunities for children to practice those behaviors. And other centers have also developed things like songs and other things to help with the teaching of the expectations. So when going in and conducting a preset, one of the things you would ask for would be to review copies of the lesson plans that are available to be able to see whether there is documentation available that shows that the expectations are being explicitly taught to children. Here is an example of a lesson plan created by the same program, Children Unlimited, uh, in which the program wanted to simply be able to teach the children to say the school rules, remember them, and say what they mean. Um, so they uh, refer to this skill as the ability to restate the rule. 
In this lesson plan, you see there's an introduction, there is a means uh, and a description of how the rules will be taught, as well as how the rules will be acknowledged and how children will be provided with recognition and feedback. In the teaching section, on the second line, you'll see that they have incorporated the use of a song to teach the children what those rules are. And Elizabeth, if you um, quickly go over to the next slide, you'll be able to get a glimpse of what that song is. It is their Come On Board song. They use a train theme when they are teaching their behavioral expectations. And they use each of the key words, be kind, be safe, take care, and fix it, and emphasize those concepts within the song for the children to help them remember. And you're going to sing it for us, right, Tina? I'm not going to <laughs> sing it for you. I think everybody would hang up and we would lose all interest. <laughs> no, that's a cute song, though. Okay, and then another component of this seeing if the teachers and children know the expectations are, as I had mentioned before, is asking the classroom teachers and, and at least three children. And the teachers are the ones who ask the children rather than the preset administrator because the person who's doing the preset may not know the children very well. And so the teacher would be a much better person to ask the children um, because we would assume he or she would be familiar with the, the kids. Um, and there are allowances for adaptations, use of a communication device, or simplifying the language, or allowing the children to respond with gestures or other things, whatever makes sense for the child, given that we're talking about very young children. And on the scoring of this, you're noting whether the majority of teachers and children were able to state the program expectations. And so it's not 100%. 100% is not required in order to get a full um, full points for this item. Because we do expect sometimes that a teacher might be feeling nervous or that the kid, one child might be newer to the classroom and doesn't answer that day or something. And so that those allowances are made within the scoring. The third feature C is responses to appropriate and challenging behavior. We're looking for some evidence that teachers implement some kind of developmentally appropriate system of positive reinforcement across classrooms. And that system can look really different um, at different centers. It has to make sense for that center and fit with their philosophy. And some examples of what we've seen centers do are having raffle tickets for cleaning up after discovering time. And then after enough tickets are collected, the kids will have a silly hat day or the teachers give kids pom-poms after they've done some kind of friendship skill like sharing or helping another child when they're hurt and then when they have enough collected they get to come to school in their pajamas. So and those are low-cost ideas that, um, that end up reinforcing those expectations that the program has. We want some evidence regarding the challenging behaviors that the program has come up with a function-based response procedure that has different hierarchies for different levels of challenging behavior. So um, it's if they have redirection for really low-level challenging behavior or discussing uh, behavioral incidents with kids, that makes sense for those lower level. But then what do they have in place in writing to deal with more severe challenging behavior? Um, and we want to make sure that that procedure both exists and is implemented consistently across classrooms, and that both the program administrator and all the teachers are aware of what those procedures are and what to do when they have a certain situation. We're also observing the teachers um, during a 10-minute observation to see how they are talking to the children and whether or not the ratio of their positive versus negative statements is higher for the positive versus the negative statements. And we're looking for specific verbal praise at least once, and, and that can be encouraging um, praise. And then use of pre-correction as well, which is heading off a situation ahead of time with a reminder about what the expectation is. So here is an example of an acknowledgement system created by Children Unlimited. The, um, I'm glad you mentioned the idea about 
the acknowledgement system needing to match the philosophy of the program, Elizabeth, because this acknowledgement system um, was developed specifically with the program's belief that uh, children's intrinsic motivation needs to be fostered when you think about acknowledgement systems. Therefore, this program chose to use the pom-pom jar, which I see happen quite a bit, but they put a slight twist on it in that children are taught and encouraged to recognize themselves and each other for positive behaviors rather than just having teachers acknowledge those behaviors for children, which really met the program's philosophy of helping to develop children's intrinsic motivation. And then when the jar is full, the entire class is able to celebrate by, for reaching that goal with um, various parties that they discuss ahead of time. They may just want extra time on the playground one day. They may choose a pajama party. They may choose a bubble blowing party. But that is something that's discussed ahead of time in terms of um, when the jar is full, that will be the next reward. Very cool. And then the procedure for responding to challenging behavior should have some sort of flow chart or other kind of visual that shows how the teacher should respond to different kinds of challenging behavior in development appropriate ways. So Children Limited um, created this response system that addresses challenging behaviors in their program, which is a very generalized system for addressing challenging behaviors. And it starts with number one, you simply observe the challenging behavior happening, and then the, that behavior is calmly discussed and addressed with the child at the child's developmental level as well as at the child's physical level. And uh, if needed, the child can be area to, to allow for privacy for this conversation to happen. Within the third step, the teacher and child or adult and child really try to problem solve. They identify the child's feelings and help the child label those feelings and the misbehavior that occurred. There is a restating of the rule. They work in the use of the rules poster and discuss what could be done next time as well as practicing that new behavior that is addressed. And in num step number four is about determining a strategy to help that child resume the activity or the routine that's going on in the classroom. Now, if the behavior, I'm referring to the box in the middle of this chart now, if the behavior meets the defined criteria for documentation, then a behavior incident report would be completed and submitted to the office. This would be reviewed with the director and um, entered into a behavior management data system. And then the classroom teachers would be sure that universal supports are being impl implemented and revised if needed if there seems to be a lapse in any way that they can uh, identify. Here's an example of challenging behavior death definitions from Children Unlimited. These are the six uh, behaviors that they chose to be the most predominant and the most disruptive to the classroom processes. So they really are looking to document any physical aggression, self-injury, disruption or tantrum, verbal aggression, non-compliance, or incidents involving children running away or leaving the designated area without um, permission to do so. Children Unlimited then went ahead and determined strategies for responding to the challenging behaviors. And this is just a sample. It's not an all-inclusive list. I wasn't able to fit it all on one screen, but it does at least give you an example of some of the strategies that are used, including lower level um, responses such as reteaching and practicing the expected behavior, verbal reminders, and then they do have some more uh, hierarchical type of responses such as removing a child from an area or using physical guidance and um, contacting the family as well when behaviors become more extreme in nature. So taken together, that system at Children Unlimited would count for full points on the preset on those items for having a system in place to respond to challenging behavior. 
in order to get <clears throat> excuse me full points for the positive and negative statements that we're observing during the 10 minute observation we're looking for a ratio of at least four positive comments to each negative comment and some examples of positive comments are um, encouragement I see you building a big tower or um, thanks for sitting down so quickly, anything like that. And negative comments are things like, no, stop doing that, um, no, not like that, do it like his, things like that. So these examples that we have listed here, there's a mix of negative ones, the first one and the last one, and then the middle two would be examples of positive comments that would be scored in that way on the form. We're also looking for at least one instance of specific verbal praise where the child's actions are included in the statement. So um, good job using your listening ears during circle would be an example of both a positive comment that would be scored in the ratio calculation and it would also count as a specific verbal praise instance for that check on the form. And then we're also looking for at least one instance of a pre-correction. These are statements or other kinds of actions that are used prior to a situation where you think that the children are likely to exhibit a challenging behavior. Like if they're always running to get a drink of water before they come in from or before a situation, then a pre-correction might make sense for that situation where you remind them to use their walking feet ahead of time instead of dealing with them running and then saying something after they've already started running. So remember to use your walking feet or please use your quiet voices when we go back to the classroom. Those are examples of um, pre-corrections and we're just looking for one, at least one. For future de-organized and predictable environment, we're looking for a physical classroom schedule that's posted on the wall. So there's a section of the preset when we go through the forms where you'll see there's a part where you're looking for actual objects in the classroom. And this one's a, an object that we're checking if it's there or not. And then we're also probing with questions to see if the teachers and the children know their schedule. So we ask the teachers, for example, what happens after circle or if they're in snack time right then, we could say, what happens after this? And see if they answer based on what their schedule says. And the teacher asks at least three children in the same manner that the teacher asks them about the program expectations. We're also looking, doing an observation of a transition from a more unstructured to a more structured routine. So an example would be going from a free play setting routine to a circle time. And we're looking for the use of a transition signal prior to that transition and a verbal notice or some kind of warning. And some examples of the warning would be something like two more minutes and then we clean up. And also um, examples of signals would be things like turning the lights on and off, playing a song, singing a song, ringing a bell, sounding a chime. Any of those would count as a signal. It just can't be just the verbal direction of let's go to circle. Tina, why don't you explain this section? Absolutely. So in feature E, uh, which is called monitoring and decision making, we're really looking at um, the use of a data collection form to to document challenging behaviors on a daily basis within the classroom environment. Uh, we're looking to ensure that that form is not only developed and in existence, but is being used in most classrooms. And we want to uh, make sure that the program has some sort of a, a system, a computer system, software, a data entry person, and time for inputting and examining the data that's generated um, from collecting the behavior incident data on at least a monthly basis. So in the next slide, I have an example from Children of Unlimited of their behavior incident report. It includes the general information about the child in classroom at the top, 
as well as in each of the next sections, just a very quick way to be able to check off the basics about what happened. Uh, data collection can be a monotonous and challenging task in early childhood settings and classrooms because classrooms are very busy. So we have found that the easiest way um, to help teachers buy into taking data is to make it as simple as possible. In this example, you see the um, various routines in which the behavior could occur during. All the, the teacher has to do is check off which routine it happened during. And then the likely motivation or um, what the child was trying to gain or avoid from the behavior can also be checked off. The challenging behavior that occurred is then next, and again, it's a quick check as to what happened. You, the teacher is then able to check off any of the involved people that apply in the next section, as well as the staff response that was used or the consequence that was used at the time. And if there is any administrative need for follow-up, there is a section there in which that response can be checked off as well. I'd like to share with you very quickly an example of a behavior incident system that uh, can be used and was developed in New Hampshire by myself and Howard Muscott. It's the Behavior Incident Reporting and Check-In System for Early Childhood Program, also called Virtus for short. It's a relational database. It's web-based and password protected and includes early childhood friendly behaviors, definitions, routines, and responses. That would be teacher responses as well as administrative responses that are designed for early childhood settings. And it has charting and graphing capabilities. So the system is able to um, put all of the data that's entered into it in graph form for quick reference. And if um, you'll switch to the next slide, Elizabeth will see an example. Here is a, a behavior incident chart by challenging behavior. So across the left side of the chart, you'll see the number of incidents that have occurred. And across the bottom, you see the type of incidents that could be occurring. So uh, under disruption tantrum, there were 53 incidents. Under unsafe behaviors, you'll see 50 incidents. So it really gives you a very quick visual snapshot as, of, as to what behaviors are the most problematic. Uh, at the top of the chart, hang on, go back a sec if you can. At the top of the chart, you, you'll see a date range there. So this data is, um, first of all, fictitious. It's not from any one program. It's, it also covers a time period from September 1st through September 14th of the following year. So this is over the course of a year. Within the system, you are really able to look at um, the time frame that you select on your ch charts. And if you go ahead to the next slide now, Elizabeth, um, I'll just give you another example of how the data can be looked at. This is behavior incidents by routine, where you're able to see how many incidents are occurring within the routines of the classroom or routines of the day. So this is an example system that we would be looking for in the preset that really um, aggregates the information and makes decision making uh, much easier at the program wide level. So feature F is family involvement, and one of the items on the preset is to assess whether lead teachers communicate with families regularly and not just during pickup and drop off, which of course we want them to do if they do have a pickup drop off um, time where the families are there, but also through phone, email, and notes, so or a journal back and forth, something that's in addition to that pickup drop off time because that even if it does happen, if the children aren't best is usually a rush situation where the families are headed off to work or something. And um, so we want them to be talking to families in other ways as well. And another item is whether or not the families are invited to and do participate in the classrooms as visitors, reading a book, playing music, if they have parent meetings of some kind, or um, a system for having classroom helpers. We also assess whether or not the families were included in the development or the refinement of their program-wide expectations. It would be nice if the families had some input into that process and weren't just told what the program expectations were so that there might be a good contextual fit both at the center but also with families um, and their values. 
And we also want to assess if the families were notified of the program-wide PBIS strategies in writing, and that's usually done through the newsletter. So if they have a fall newsletter, we would hope that that outlines what the center's PBIS strategies are. Or if they have a program handbook or a parent handbook, it could happen there too. Feature G management is whether or not they have a, a team established to address PBEIS and um, whether or not the teachers in the center know about the team and can tell the preset administrator who what the function of that team is, what they're doing. So that's really assessing what the knowledge base is around that team and what they do. And the team should include appropriate members, and those appropriate members are going to be different depending on the center, but they should definitely include classroom teachers and administrators. Somebody should be on the team who has behavioral or social skills expertise, and someone should also be on the team with family or community knowledge. The team should meet at least monthly and have a yearly action plan with specific goals, and should be reporting progress to the rest of the program at least twice a year. And I know that but when Tina's done this too, we, we sometimes see all of this and sometimes we see pieces of it where they're having a, a leadership team but maybe they don't have teachers on the team. So we incur that means that that team needs to consider how to involve the teachers in that team and give them release time or something so that um, with floaters so that they can come to that meeting or change the meeting time. Or perhaps they have a yearly action plan, but the rest of the school isn't aware of the progress and isn't, they don't have a formal procedure for doing that. So sometimes the preset can give them that information that, about how to go about doing that. Feature H or program support is the last subscale and has to do with the budget, time and access to resources for teachers, and professional development for teachers. And we're looking for a budget that has funds for building and maintaining PBIS, it, the effort does require some sort of um, monies for doing different initiatives. And so we want to make sure that they actually have that in place and have thought that through, that teachers have the time and access to resources that they need. And that is done with both administrator report about that and from teachers. So we don't want to just rely on the administrator. For that, we want to make sure the teachers are saying that they indeed um, also feel like they have the time and access to resources they need, and that there's at least one professional development related to PBIS each year. Tina, you can go over this. Sure. Slide. So um, in terms of administering the preset, during the initial phase of PBIS implementation, the preset should be ad administered ideally twice yearly. You, um, it's very valuable to be able to go into a program and conduct a preset before they've started implementing PBIS in order to get some Results as well. It really shows the amount of growth um, that happens with the team and within the program when there's a baseline and a post score within that first year. And then after that, it's recommended that once yearly thereafter allows for the team to be able to measure and monitor their growth as well as determine what their yearly action plan will be for the upcoming year when it's done once a year thereafter. The preset does take about uh, one hour for a program that has one to two classrooms. And then you'll want to consider adding about 20 to 30 minutes more for each additional classroom within that program. Um, when I go into programs, I usually find myself sitting down for the administrator interview about 20 to 30 minutes with the in administrator. And then because of the um, classroom observation piece and the requirement to uh, observe a transition from a less structured routine to a more structured routine, sometimes you have to time that really well, uh, especially if classrooms seem to be following similar schedules and routines. So that's something to keep in mind in terms of the observation piece. 
The preset is designed to be used by trained researchers or independent evaluators, such as consultants. It is really not designed to be a self-evaluation. Uh, an example like that would be a preschool director conducting the preset on their own program. It wasn't designed to be done in this way. It's really designed to be an external evaluator's uh, representation of how the program is doing with their PBIS programming. Training should be conducted by trained preset users and um, we really emphasize, especially for research purposes, if you're using the preset for research, to that um, inter-rater reliability of 85 percent be established uh, in order to say that your results are as valid as possible. Tina and um, Amy Perkins, I'm realizing about the time that we're supposed to be signing off, I think in a few minutes. So I'm not sure if we, it should, would be a better use of time to go over the forms or to do a Q&A at this point. Um, hi, this is Amy. So I think we, we don't have too many questions right now. So if um, you do have questions, please you can enter them into the question box now, but I think you have time to show the forms, Elizabeth and Tina, and then I'll, when I start seeing um, questions come in, I'll break in maybe in like five or so minutes. Okay. So I think it would be nice to, that way um, everyone can see the forms. Okay. Tina, you may do the forms since they're on your computer, right? Absolutely. So I will go ahead and um, take control of the mouse here again and try to get us through to the slides with the forms. Elizabeth, do you still have control over there? Can you click the slides through? I do not. Okay, so just give me a second here and I will figure out how to get back control because I am not um, able to either. Elizabeth, you might be able to um, click the the give keyboard and mouse button to give it back to Tina, perhaps. That might. I will see if. Um... Sorry for the delay on this. For anyone out there listening, it's the, the technical glitches that occur are always inevitable. I don't see that option. Okay. Um. Okay, it's just odd because when I go to my list, Elizabeth is no longer um, in control of keyboard and mouse. Um, however, I'm, I don't seem to be able to, there, there we go, I got it. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, that's okay. So, now that we got through that little error. Um, in terms of the preset administration, this is the order in which uh, the preset happens. So the first thing that would happen would be the interview with the program administrator, and uh, that's done using the, the preset administrator interview form, and I will pop that up so that you can see it. Uh, so it's a very structured interview process. The questions are um, already outlined for you as well as an introductory sentence to announce each feature that's going to be addressed. So let's start by discussing general information is where we start and then I'd like to gather some information about individual classrooms and there's a, a chart there to uh, document how many classrooms, ages served, number of children, all of those important features. And then we really go into the features of the preset Let's talk about the program, starting with behavioral expectations you have established. And each question is uh, listed there for each feature, as well as a scoring section, so that you are essentially able to score whether those questions are or are not in place. There are also um, boxes where notes can be taken so that you can listen, take a few notes, and go back and score later if that helps you. Um, and it is the administrator interview form is set up so that each feature and each critical question that pertains to administration of PBIS is addressed within the features uh, of the preset. So that is what the administrator form looks like, just to give you 
a quick heads up or a quick snapshot of what that looks like. Um, after, let me go back to slide. After discussing uh, the administrator interview, the observations and interviews within the classrooms then would happen, about 20 to 30 minutes per classroom. And uh, we have designed a preset classroom interview and observation form to help really um, streamline how quickly this can happen within the classroom. So on this a form, the lead teacher questions are outlined. I'm sorry, the teacher questions are outlined at the top. The children's questions are outlined on the right side over here. And then the, the lead teacher only questions are across the bottom of the um, screen. So an example question of what you would ask the lead teacher is how do you teach the program rules in your classroom? There is a blank spot under each question so that you can write down notes about the teacher's response. And then uh, under that, um, you, you can then go back and score whether the um, item should be scored as a yes or no, depending on how the teacher responds to your questions or how the children respond to the questions that are answered. On the back of the classroom interview and observation form is where you would be looking at classroom environmental pieces, such as the program rules being posted uh, in at least one classroom location at the children's eye level and you would just circle yes or no is that in place Do the, does the program have a combination of words and visuals on their poster and again you would just circle yes or no is that in place there's also a section here to take notes so that you can go back and think about what you've seen what you've observed and the 10 minute observation here is you here is where you would tally the number of positive statements versus the number of negative statements you hear and we actually have you do out a ratio for positive statements to negative statements is a t an average of two and we're looking for a result of four or greater so in that example the answer there would be no and then um, just a simple yes or no about the transitions happening and pre-corrections and signals and verbally as well are done on the um, classroom interview and observation form from there you would take the scores after scoring your administrator interview form and your classroom interview and observation form, and those scores get transferred to a classroom summary form. So for classroom one, did the teacher state the rules? And here you just simply write yes or no, Y or N, um, in terms of how you scored it on your classroom interview and observation form. So did the teachers state the rules? Yes. Did the teacher state what happens next in terms of the routine? No. Did the children state the rules? No. Did the children state what happens next? Yes. So you would just go through for each classroom interview form that you have and write Y or N under each of those specific questions. And what this does is if you have five classrooms in a program, you can then easily count up. Oh, there were four out of five yeses. And yes in the majority means they get a score of two. So that a number two would go into that section for that item for the overall program score. And you would do that for all of the items that are scored from the classroom interview and observation form. That will help really summarize all of the information gained from each of the classroom observations that happen. After that, we then go to the preset scoring guide, which I'm going to have to just quickly pull up this way. Okay, so here is the actual scoring guide. Guide. So the features are listed here. Here's expectations defined, and these are the essential questions for this feature that we want to be able to answer. Um, for each of the questions, there is the data source where you would find the answer is listed right next to the question. So has the program agreed to five or fewer positively stated expectations? We can look to the administrator interview form for that. And uh, the scoring is if, there, if it hasn't happened yet, then that's a zero. If, if it's a yes, but there's more than five or they're negatively stated or classrooms have their own expectations, 
we give them some credit, but they wouldn't get full credit. That would be a score one. And then, of course, if they meet all of the criteria, the score would be two. So the scoring guide helps um, to give you the ability to score within that zero, one, or two scoring system framework each item for each feature that we are looking for. Um, so I'll just go through the rest of it. Here we have C. Um, responses to appropriate and challenging behavior. The other features are also here. And at the uh, end of that scoring form, you're able to add up the total amount of um, score or points that the program was able to get for each of the features. So in feature A, if they were able to get eight out of eight points, the percent implemented for that feature would be 100%, and so on for each of the other features. And then down here, um, you would take the, the uh, percent implemented for all of the features combined, divide it by the eight features, and that gives you the average percent implemented for the entire tool. And that is what the forms look like. Let me uh, head back here. That's great. Thanks, Tina, for showing the forms. I think that was helpful. Sure. Um, we can take a few questions now, um, if that's okay with Elizabeth, you and Elizabeth. Is that good? It is fine with me. Sure. Okay, great. Sure. Um, and so for those listening in, feel free to enter your questions now in the question box too. Um, okay, so one of the questions about is about who should conduct the preset. Um, you said, you know, it's not a self-evaluation, so should the person who's coming in um, to evaluate the program, should they be familiar with the program or teachers at all? Or what do you recommend? They do not need to be familiar with them, and it's okay and wonderful if they are familiar with the center. So it really can be either way. They should, if they're not familiar with the center, definitely talk to the center director or administrator ahead of time and do introductions and explanations about what the preset will look like and in terms of what the preset person will be doing at the center and what he or she will need from the director and from the teachers. Um, so there should be communication ahead of time, but okay. they don't have to be instantly knowledgeable. Okay, great, thanks. Um, okay, so for when you do the observations, um, should the teachers be told in advance that there's going to be the observation from the um, outside person? Absolutely. <laughs> yes, I don't think any preschool yes. teacher appreciates right. <laughs> surprised um, about somebody coming in to observe. So we generally ask the center administrator to tell the teachers who's coming and why and, and what will be done and assure the person that it's not an evaluation of them or, you know, that it's something that's helpful for the whole center because of this PBIS initiative that's going to be happening or is happening or that they've been working on. So, you no, know, there should be full disclosure and full knowledge ahead of time about what's going on. Okay. So it's transparent and not surprising. That makes sense. <laughs> um. <laughs> We had a question that was submitted during the registration process. Um, is there a family component to the preset? Just yes, the there is a subscale. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm sorry, Tina. That's okay. So I was just going to try to answer that. There is the family engagement or family involvement a subscale that really looks at the uh, level of involvement that happens with families and the preschool children in the classroom. Great. Um, Okay, and then can the preset be used by programs who are using other tools, such as other observation tools like the class um, or the the Eckers? Do you have Do you ever work with programs who are using more than one of these, um, you know, measurement tools? Yes, I have. We, we okay. both, you go ahead. We both do. Yeah, I was going to say I've worked with programs using the class and the teapot and the preset, and then. I've worked with some preschools who are connected to elementary schools, and the elementary school is using the set, and the preschool and the kindergarten is using the preset. But Tina, talk about your experiences. 
Uh, sure. My, my experience is specifically with uh, usage of the class as well as the preset in one of the uh, grants we just recently finished. And uh, the, the class provides valuable information about the relationship and the um, interactions and communication between the children and the, and the teachers or the staff in the, in the classroom as well as the environmental piece. Um, which really can correlate well to some of the features of the preset. And the preset offers additional information beyond what the class can collect or does collect. So they're, they're very complementary, but they both offer um, different information as well. So it's very valuable to have both of those. Great. Thank you. And then I think we have, like, we have one final question. Um, can you share... You might have probably in the presentation might have um, been planning to talk about this, but since we're cut a little short, um, can you talk a little bit about how results um, after the, get shared with the administrator and the teacher, how you recommend, um, I guess, programs use the results and what they learn from it? Well, I can talk about the results that are on the screen right now. <laughs> okay. So this is this is an example of, of one of the ways that I show uh, results, and this is um, the the actual program results that came from Children Unlimited as they they went through the PBIS process and implementing that in their program. Uh, so this I really like to show in chart form or graph graph form um, implementation over time and growth and progress over time. So they uh, the blue. The blue bar there represents their scores within the fall of 09 or their baseline pre-implementation scores. And then the red and green bars following show the growth and progress that occurred each year afterwards. So this is a really nice visual way to be able to look at how much growth and progress occurred over that three-year time period. Um, and just looking at the, uh, it, it, well, it breaks it down per feature of the preset as well as the average percent implemented, which is the last set of bars at the end of the chart there going from, you know, 50, about 56 percent at baseline up to about 97 percent at the end of the grant year shows tremendous progress and growth and a, a phenomenally motivated team that did the, all of that work. So I love to show the results in that way. Um, just a quick thank you to that program for letting us share those examples. But we also do have, um, I'm going to, I thought I put them in here. Aha. We also have the preset feedback form, which is a nice way to look at providing that feedback. It, prov it gives you a guide. Um, you are able to write down the percent implemented for each feature. It gives you a format to follow. So here's a, an empty graph that you could fill out for the program based on what their actual scores are. And um, if you use the feedback forms, you can really tailor your uh, feedback and your recommendations per feature after using the scoring guide and saying, okay, there are lots of strengths within these items and here are some areas to work on. You can really target within each feature what can be worked on just by filling in the blank of the feedback form that is available on the uh, tool that you can purchase separately. And then there's also uh, the, the preset action plan, which can be used. Oops, I don't think that's going to work. Let me go back to the slide mode here, and then I'll be able to open it. Sorry for the popping up and in and out in different frames here. The action plan is also one of the forms available as part of the preset package that really allows uh, the program to not only look at their scores, but look at each feature and decide well, what are we going to work on, uh, when are we going to implement this, put a date, put a goal in place, and actually be able to document when that goal is achieved. And then for each of the features that is possible with the critical items that oh, Tina, I think we're having some audio issues working towards can you hear me now? Yes, I think, yeah, we can hear you now. We had a little static. Okay, so I was just saying this, this final um, page really helps to tabulate on a month-by-month -month basis 
which of the goals that the team has determined are important to work on are being met uh, month by month and, and uh, over the course of a year so that by the time another preset evaluation time comes, the items of key importance aren't forgotten about on the action plan throughout the year. That's great. Thank you for showing those forms. That's helpful. Um, I think we're nearing the end of our, our allotted time here. Um, but Tina, could you show the, the slide that has the information about training I think would be helpful to show? Um, Absolutely. So Tina and Elizabeth do offer training. Um, you can find information on brooksonlocation.com um, and contact us if you have any questions about, about training on the preset. And then we also have, um, as a thank you for all of you listening today, we have a 20% um, off discount code that you can use um, if you're interested in purchasing the preset or on any of our Brooks products. So you'll see on the screen there that the, the, larger, um, the larger image is for the manual. And so the manual talks about administ the administration guidelines for the preset and has a, um, a really nice case study at the end that shows the preset in use with the preschool program. The smaller square is um, the forms, the ones that Tina was showing you on your screen, um, are all available on CD-ROM. So they're PDF files on the CD-ROM, and you can print them as often as you need. So there's no, you don't have to um, keep buying consumable forms. You can just, the CD is a one-time purchase. Um, and then you can just keep printing them as needed. So Tina and Elizabeth, thank you so much for showing us um, your presentation. And all, I loved all of the examples for the, Early Childhood Center. I thought that was really helpful. Um, I think You're welcome. Pleasure. Yes. So, and thank you everyone for listening. Um, and if you have any more follow-up questions, um, you can email me. You'll get a, everyone will get a follow-up email tomorrow, so you can reply to that follow-up email. Um, you'll get a link to the recording for the webinar, and you're welcome to share that with others in your program um, and to come back and watch it. Watch it again if you need it. Um, so thank you very much for joining us, and thank you, Elizabeth and Tina. Have thank a wonderful you. day. Bye-bye.